Where we got last time was basically to the end of chapter three in the book. So we have created our first climate model, which balances energy coming in and energy going out. And it, it uh, in cartoon form, it looks like this. And this is sunlight. And this is infrared. And the temperature of the ground uh, determines how strong the infrared is. And so the temperature at the ground is like water flowing into that kitchen sink that we talked about last time that has water flowing in from a, a faucet and going down the drain. And the water level in the sink is, uh, it determines how fast the water is flowing down the drain. The temperature of the earth is, is like that. It determines how fast the heat energy is lost from the planet. And so just like the sink, the water level in the sink finds a value at which it's balancing the books. Uh, that's what this, this planet does as well. So that was a climate model that could deal with, you know, a little bit anyway, uh, variations in the intensity of the sun and, and the reflectivity of the earth. Uh, but it didn't have a whole bunch of things in it. And one of the things that it doesn't have, which is why it's too cold, is a greenhouse effect. So then the next iteration of this thing uh, has sunlight coming through an atmosphere. Going to the ground. And then the ground shines in some infrared light according to the temperature of the ground <coughs> using uh, the formula that we talked about last time, uh, epsilon sigma t to the fourth. So epsilon is the emissivity. Uh, it's essentially whether an object is a black body or not. Uh, sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, just a number you look up. Uh, and then the temperature to the fourth. So the ground is emitting infrared and it all gets absorbed by the atmosphere and the atmosphere absorbs infrared going both up and down. And your job in lab this week is to figure out the temperatures of the ground and the atmosphere as, you, as we sort of twiddle around, get, get familiar with how we calculate what the temperature of the ground and the atmosphere is. So we derived and figured out this case in class on Friday. And uh, you know, a good place to start is to kind of look at that. And then in lab, you'll be doing some variations on this, like uh, nuclear winter. Let's say we put a big cloud of dust here, and the uh, sunlight gets absorbed there instead of there. Turns out that makes a huge difference in the climate of the Earth, as you will discover to your delight and astonishment, I'm sure. Um, now, some of you have kind of picked up that, you know, these are pretty simple climate models. And, you know, are you going to get your money's worth here? You can't really predict climate change, global warming, or the weather, or, you know, there's all kinds of things that are not in this model. Like one person mentioned the fact that the whole Earth is not all the same temperature. And someone else said, well, does the real atmosphere absorb all of the infrared? And the answer to both of those questions is that, yes, the model is, is way too simple. It's a great place to start because it's simple enough that you can kind of get your, your mind around it. I personally had already finished a PhD doing ocean carbon chemistry, CO2 in the ocean. And the whole point of studying CO2 in the ocean is to figure out about climate. But I didn't really understand the greenhouse effect until I was prepping to start teaching this class, you know, 10 or more years ago, and I read about this model. So all of a sudden, it kind of clicked for me. You know, this is the simplest model that can give you the greenhouse effect, but now we've got some work to do to patch it up, to talk about the real world. And, uh, and that's what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks now, is talk about ways that the real world is different from this, this very simple climate model, the layer model. Uh, and the first way that the atmosphere is, the real world is different that we're going to deal with has to do with uh, the real greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Okay. 
Some gases are greenhouse gases. Most of the gases in the atmosphere are not. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is why, what makes a greenhouse gas? Why are some gases uh, infrared active? They can absorb and emit infrared and other gases are not. <laughs> so to start out with, uh, there are a couple of different ways to generate light. from matter, ways that matter can create light. And we talked about this a little bit, but we're going to talk about it again in just a little more detail. Um, one way is a way that we haven't really talked about yet, uh, but it turns out to be the way that is most important to sort of how we see the world, and that is uh, electron excitation. So electrons are, are kind of uh, tricky things when after we after I, I have told you about quantum mechanics because electrons you know, they're sort of the poster child for what a particle should be, like a pool ball or something, but they also had this kind of a weird wave character. Of course, all matter has wave character, but, you know, like this piece of chalk has a wavelength, but it's so huge that the wavelength is so small that we can kind of just forget about it. Where an electron is small enough that the wave component starts to really control the way the electron works. Uh, so let's think about waves for a second. Um, let's imagine a guitar. And this is the, these are two ends of uh, where on a guitar that hold the, the guitar string. And one way to make sort of a wave on that guitar string uh, is what a physicist would call an n equal one wave that just has the whole string going on the same direction at the same time, and then it sort of goes back the other way like that. So within the same, with the constraints of the same uh, guitar string, same guitar and same string and everything, you can make other waves on this thing. So what a physicist would call an n equal two wave, kind of has a stable point in the middle, and then it kind of goes back and forth, sort of like that. And then you can you can imagine an n equals three wave and so on. But there's not an n equals one half wave that can fit on there. If you tried to fill this up with one and a half waves, it would be it would not match up at the end and it wouldn't it would that that would quickly die. So that would be like trying to play a G note on a C string. You can't can't do that. This plays this the, the C and this actually plays an octave higher than C, so you know when they used to like bang on their guitars back in my youth. They would a lot of times uh, put your thumb right in the center of the string and then pluck it a little bit off and you excite this and it makes it you know an octave higher and it sounds like you know the world is coming crashing around you and everybody screams and it's, it's cool. Uh, but you can't play a G on a C string. You can only play the, the, those particular notes. Well, an electron wave around uh, the nucleus of an atom is analogous to this. Uh, so we'll have a nucleus which will draw as sort of a plus sign. And then the electron is usually drawn as some sort of a, a cloud, a cloud, sort of a, a, a fuzzy sort of circle around or sphere around the nucleus. And then some of the electron orbitals get a little funny, you know, they have sort of shapes like lobes or something like that. But the simplest ones, like around a hydrogen, a single uh, proton, a single plus one charge in the nucleus is, is a sort of a sphere like that. So that sphere is a cloud of probability. So it's saying if the number is, is uh, 0 0.1 right at some exact spot 
for example, that says that if you were to have some sort of an electron sensor that could take a picture of where that electron really is, uh, there's a 10% chance that it will be just exactly here. And maybe a 30% chance it'll be here and da 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 That's what these numbers are, is, is probabilities. And then, of course, once you look at it, you do this weird Copenhagen interpretation magic called uh, collapsing the wave function, and now you know, it goes to a value of 1.0 here and 0 every place else, like in that, that two-slit experiment that we talked about. But anyway, that's, what this, that's how this electron is sort of represented as being around this nucleus. And that these, these clouds are just like these waves in that they come in different sizes. But you can't have, you know, size and a half. They're just integral numbers of, you know, this is an n equal 1 cloud, the first energy level, an n, n equals 2 cloud might be bigger. So here's n equal 1, n equals 2, like that. So when an electron uh, is at a higher energy level and then it jumps down to a lower energy level, it would be like this guitar string suddenly going down to a lower note, you know, an octave lower, which doesn't happen on guitars, but, you know, imagine that it could by some, maybe you're banging the guitar on something and so it, you know, is exchanging energy with, with the, the, the big stack of Marshall amps or whatever you've got going. Uh, when it relaxes from the high energy level to the lower energy level, it gives off light. And when we see colors of things, this is mostly what we're seeing, is the, the, the energy levels uh, differing between the, the, the different states of the electron wave uh, that happen to give off light in the visible range that we can see. So dyes oftentimes have long uh, molecules that have lots of electrons kind of not held very tightly so it's pretty easy to excite them and, 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 uh, and let them relax back and that makes, makes colors. Um, so without quantum mechanics everything would just be sort of gray. There would be no colors. I mean without quantum mechanics the universe would be totally different so it's a silly thing to say but it is kind of amazing that what we see as colors all come from this, these quantum mechanical sort of waves. Now, this isn't real important for gases in the atmosphere most of the time. Uh, most of the gases in the atmosphere are so simple, like uh, O2, N2, and argon, are the three main gases in the atmosphere and they have energy levels for the electrons but they're so simple that the energy levels are so far apart that if you actually make light in this way what you get is uh, is ultraviolet light not visible light so the change in energy between levels is too high to make visible instead it makes ultraviolet yeah I don't really understand uh, well one way to, that people draw these that, that visualize this is to draw a, a plot that has energy as sort of an axis here and um, let's say that an electron in its lowest energy state could be could have that much energy and then the higher orbitals which are like these bigger waves uh, have higher energy levels so um, if an electron gets knocked up to a high energy level and then it falls back down by itself it makes light because that's where the energy goes. Okay, so simple gases like oxygen, nitrogen, and argon have energy levels that are farther apart. So a ground state, and then maybe the first one, and the second one, or something. So if you fall that far, you don't, 
the energy you give off is too intense to make visible light. Instead, you're making ultraviolet light. Now, there are some exceptions in the atmosphere that make uh, visible light. One of them is um, something that we can see sometimes out over the lake. If you go out to the point and kind of look out over the lake, especially if you look at like downtown or something, uh, there's this chemical that's part of urban smog called uh, NO2. So NO2, uh, it's part of, um, it's part of, there's another, another one called NO, and these two together are called NOx. So any of you are like into ozone and, and crappy urban air, you may have heard about NOx. Anyway, this NO2 is, is a complicated enough molecule that it makes light in the visible, and it's sort of brown. So see, you see this sort of a poopy brown color in the air kind of over the lake sometimes, or if you're flown into LA, you get it really good there. That's because of this NO2. But most of the gases in the atmosphere don't, don't do visible light. They're transparent to visible light. So the way that uh, we talked about before, and now we're going to talk about some more, is uh, vibration of bonds. So vibrating chemical bonds where the atoms have an electrical charge uh, make light. We've talked about before, so an oscillator that has uh, the capability of, of oscillating at all different frequencies, that's what a black body is. Um, so this you've all seen before. Um, for some pair of atoms with a spring in between, it has a uh, characteristic frequency determined by the strength of the spring and the, the weight of the, 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 the nuclei there. And um, in classical physics, when we first talked about this, we said that the frequency of the vibration has to equal the frequency of the, the light, because that's what's observed. And then quantum mechanics kind of uh, dress that up a little bit by saying put it down here give quantum mechanics its own by saying that uh, the uh, energy levels of The vibration, so again, you could draw one of these diagrams with different energy levels. Uh, the vibration has the same constraint. The vibration, the difference between these energy levels is got to be equal to the energy of a photon of light. So that sounds very different, but uh, it turns out that uh, the energy levels of the vibration oscillator uh, are just equal to a constant times the frequency, and the energy of the photon is equal to the same constant times the frequency of the photon. So you end up with the frequency of the vibration equals the frequency of the light. Just like Isaac Newton said it should be, it all sort of makes sense. The new theory kind of subsumes the old one, right? It doesn't flush all the good things about the old toilet, you know, thing down the toilet, it, 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 it uh, encompasses. Okay, so you've seen all that before. Uh, but the part of this that you haven't seen before, and that turns out to be really important for uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, is that when you make the chemical bond uh, vibrate, it has to have sort of traction on the electric field. So simple gases like oxygen and nitrogen, let's start with oxygen. Oxygen has uh, got two oxygen atoms, and uh, it turns out there's a double bond <coughs> uh, 
between them, which just means that it has four electrons rather than two. Two electrons is a single bond, and there are also actually triple bonds in chemistry. Nitrogen has a triple bond, we'll see in a second. But it doesn't really change anything as far as we're concerned. It still acts like a spring. There's still an optimum distance apart for those two uh, oxygen nuclei. And if you pull them apart or push them forward, it, it's higher energy, so it tends, tends to vibrate. But the thing about oxygen molecule here is that it's totally symmetric. And, you know, there might be a little bit of negative charge on one side or the other, probably because there's a chemical bond in the middle. Maybe this has sort of a bit of a negative charge in the middle, and then maybe some, some sort of positive charge on the ends or something like that. Uh, but whatever it is, whatever these, these uh, bonds do to the sort of uh, electrical field around that molecule, it's the same on one side as the other. So you stretch it apart, put it together, it doesn't really matter. Uh, there's no sort of difference between a, like a plus, plus on one side and a minus on the other that would, uh, there's no what they call a dipole. And so uh, it has no effect really on the, on the, the electric field. And so you can wiggle this thing as much as you like, and it's not going to make infrared light. So there's no emission of infrared light or absorption. Because you know that, that mechanism of getting light into this oscillator or, or back again, that's a two-way street. So anything that can absorb can also emit. That's called Kirchhoff's law. And uh, anything, if it doesn't absorb, then it doesn't emit. And that's the case for uh, atmospheric oxygen. Uh, atmospheric nitrogen is the same way. Now it has a triple bond, but it's still symmetrical. And it's not a greenhouse gas because it just has no traction on the electric field. It doesn't. It's like a you know a broken speaker or something. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't pull on the electric field when you when you when you twist or or push or pull on that molecule. So the gas that we're mostly concerned about for climate change is carbon dioxide. CO2. So CO2, as it turns out, uh, is a linear molecule. The carbon is in the middle, and there's oxygens on both sides, and there's double bonds in between, in between them, but that again doesn't really change things all that much. Uh, so this is a symmetric molecule. And so at first glance you would think that it would not uh, do anything to the infrared light either. It wouldn't, there's no, there's no sort of resting dipole. And one of the, so a molecule that has three atoms like this has multiple different modes of vibrating. You don't think of it as, you know, this is one thing that's got, you know, one time constant and it's totally in isolation from this other chemical bond. What you've got when you put, you know, three balls together with two springs is kind of more than the sum of the parts. So, so the only way you can make this thing vibrate is, is in some particular mode that kind of fits together all three of the weights and, and both of the springs. So the modes for CO2 uh, vibration, one is there's a symmetric stretch. <coughs> where both 
sides go out and then come back in at the same time. So if my head was the carbon and my fists were the oxygen, it would be sort of like this. That's a symmetric stretch. And that one, again, it's symmetric, and so it's not what we call infrared active. But because this thing is a more complicated molecule and there's different ways, different modes of vibration that, that, that it can do, these other modes of vibration are what you know, generate this whole, this whole fuss. So one of them, the one that's actually uh, the most important for the atmosphere is a bend, a bending vibration. So it's like this. And let's say that there's sort of some minus charge here and some minus charge here and, and some leftover sort of plus charge here. When it's bent in this way, there's sort of a negative on one side and a positive on the other side, like that. And then as soon as it goes the other way, it switches the other, the other way. So it's got this dipole now. An electrical dipole, plus on one side and minus on the other. And because this bending vibration creates that electrical dipole, uh, it emits infrared light and absorbs light of the frequency of that, of that bending vibration. So the frequency of this is completely different from the frequency of that. And there's another uh, mode of vibration which we'll just get out in the open for completeness that's an asymmetric stretch. And so it's, it's kind of like this. So it's not symmetric like that, but it's, it's sort of one side gets long, the other side gets short. Let's see, so the motion would be sort of like that. So this one also distorts the electric field and so it's infrared active. So these different modes of vibration, they have different frequencies. If you just take a, you know, a CO2 molecule or some model of a CO2 molecule with three weights and two springs that you can play with and just clobber it and just it'll just go, you know, it'll look like sort of chaos, but it will all the vibrations on that thing that can kind of ring, you know, where they're self uh, well, like we talked about uh, water waves and, and, and light waves where they are sort of self-sustaining uh, perturbations. You know, where it's like the guitar string that can play the note. Uh, the vibrations that, that that thing will undergo will be the sum of this and this mode and this mode. You can sort of take it apart in that way. And each of those modes is going to have an amount of energy equal to one half kT like we talked about that Every different mode of storing energy uh, has, is like a little battery and, and how much energy it holds is a function of the temperature. So K is the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature. But it just turns out that energy in this symmetric mode doesn't make light. So it's like oxygen and nitrogen. But energy in this bend or this asymmetric mode does make light. The three of them together. I'm sorry? Uh, I said, let's see, I said that um, each mode holds uh, One half kT of energy. Uh, so, 
if you had a given temperature, a complicated gas like CO2 will hold more energy than a simple gas like oxygen, which just has one way to vibrate, or argon, which can't vibrate at all because it's a single molecule. So that's why they put argon into uh, thermal pane windows. Uh, you've got a cold window and a warm one. And so the molecules come up to the warm one and they pick up, they charge up their batteries with, you know, one half KT where the T is a warm temperature and then they go over here and they dump their heat on the cold side and that's a bad thing that's that's you know that's what you're trying to fight against in a thermal pane window uh, so an argon molecule uh, doesn't have as many ways to store energy so it doesn't pick up as much it doesn't give off as much here as say a CO2 because CO2 has all these different ways of vibrating it's, it's like got lots of these batteries and so it uh, carries it dumps more heat out through the window that's why they fill with argon did that come close to answering your question the question was jointly as a collaborative question <laughs> okay yes Uh, well, one could imagine, so let's draw the three modes of vibrating. And one, so there's the, the, the symmetric stretch. And there is the asymmetric stretch, and then there's the bend. Each one has a different uh, characteristic frequency. And I don't know, just imagining this ball with two springs in it, I could personally imagine maybe something, a situation where it would either do one or the other or the other because they have different frequencies. You know, like you can either play uh, a single note on a guitar or the double one, but uh, not so easy to do both. But in fact, the different modes of vibration, even though they have different frequencies, they can all exist on that CO2 at the same time. It can, it, it's vibrating in all three modes. In fact, if you want to put uh, one half KT into each one, you're pretty much insisting that it vibrate in all three of those different modes. Again, I'm not really sure if I'm scratching the itch here answering the question. So you're saying that always you have to vibrate for all Yeah. And pretty much any molecule that has more than two atoms is going to have a whole suite of different vibrational modes. So other gases that are greenhouse gases, um, one of them is methane. Pretty much any gas that has more than two atoms is going to be a greenhouse gas because it's going to have ways of vibrating that can distort the electric field. So methane is uh, CH4, the carbon is in the middle, and then there's four hydrogens around it in a sort of tetrahedron like that. And in its resting state, there's no dipole moment either. It's sort of symmetrical, but it's got so many different ways of vibrating that some of them are, uh, they distort, they have a dipole, and so they distort the electric field. and uh, Methane turns out to be a greenhouse gas. Water looks like this. It's actually sort of bent just in its resting state it's because there's a couple of uh, lone pairs of electrons over here that sort of fill up two legs of a somewhat distorted tetrahedron. But it's got a dipole even at rest sort of plus side and a minus side. So there's lots of ways you can vibrate this because it's a complicated molecule uh, and it can absorb and emit.
infrared. Yeah. When you say that you can put one half into the other one, mm -hmm. you're referring to the energy required to make it fire, right? Uh, that is the energy that comes from the fact that it is at a, a temperature. So, um, at a temperature, you know, at, 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 at some temperature, uh, there will be on average one half kT of energy in each of the vibrational modes and also uh, rotating in, you know, different dimensions and, and flying through space in three dimensions. These are sort of all different components of, of, of the heat energy. So, uh, a gas that has lots of different ways of vibrating here can store more heat at a given temperature. That's another way to look at this. So that's why you don't have a gas like this in a, in a thermal pane window because a CO2 has lots of different ways of moving around to store this thermal energy. Whereas something like argon, which is just a single atom with no chemical bonds, all it can do is fly in three dimensions. And so uh, it, it takes less motion energy to, f to, to change the temperature of argon. Am I making things better or worse? I feel like I'm digging a hole here somehow. Well, I just don't exactly understand what, what happens to me. How to understand what that is. I mean, could you give an example? We'll start with... an argon molecule at... Uh, zero kelvins, that's absolute zero. And so it's going to be sitting there and not moving. And then we're going to warm it up to uh, some temperature T. And uh, there are three different dimensions that that thing can fly around in. And so uh, in order to warm it up, to that we have to put in enough energy to make that thing fly around uh, three times one half kT. That's how much energy energy in joules it will take to raise the temperature of that argon atom. Now we'll do it with uh, with uh, CO2 and uh, we'll start at zero degrees C and then we'll warm it up to some temperature and um, we've got not only do we have to make this thing fly around so uh, we gotta pay for it to fly around in, in those three dimensions so that's three times one half kT plus there's a bunch of uh, vibrational states these different modes, there are three of them. And so there's another three times one half kT. And it can also rotate. So it takes more energy to make CO2 hot than it takes argon. You know, the, the sort of, uh, you can, the same thing, you touch some styrofoam that's like really hot, you just pulled it out of the oven or something. Styrofoam isn't a great example because it would melt, but you know, it won't burn you because it doesn't really store that much heat. Whereas if you stick a rock in there, the rock, even at the same temperature, will burn you much more severely because it's holding more heat. And the way it holds more heat is by having more ways of moving, more ways you can sort of store energy in, in motion of the atoms. So the two requirements for a greenhouse gas The job description, one, the, the frequency of the vibration mode has to equal the frequency of the light. So that's we talked about before. You can think of this classically. You can think of it quantum. It's the same thing. Uh, that's not news. What's news is the second requirement. Uh, 
that the vibration has to perturb the electric field. So, which of these uh, three uh, these three different gases would you suspect of being greenhouse gases in the atmosphere using power of pure logic? Uh, we have uh, freon, which is a chemical formula is is here. It's actually a lot like uh, methane. The carbon is in the middle, and like chlorines and fluorines are on the four limbs of a tetrahedron. It's used in refrigerants. It depletes ozone. Uh, but is it a greenhouse gas? That's the question. Krypton is uh, a noble gas. I don't know about what it does to Superman. I never quite figured that out. But in the in the real atmosphere, it's a noble gas like argon. And then iodine. I2, which uh, actually is got enough elect, it's sort of shaggy enough in its electrons that it uh, is another exception to the gases that uh, you can actually see. It has a brown color. So let's um, see how we're doing here. Where there it is. <laughs> So yeah, most of you get it right. The answer is uh, freon. It has uh, it's a greenhouse gas because it's got more than two atoms in it. Basically, nothing that only has one or two atoms can can uh, fulfill this requirement of perturbing the electric field. Actually, that may not be true. If you had an atom like uh, hydrogen chloride. There's probably a plus and a minus on this, and so a two-atom molecule could be a greenhouse gas. But among these, uh, freon is the is it. So, which of these things do you suppose might be a pretty good black body? So the options are atmospheric CO2, atmospheric oxygen, or a cloud. So we're getting closer to the right answer. Yay! So uh, a black body is an object that can absorb and emit in all different frequencies. Uh, and atmospheric oxygen is not going to absorb or emit in any frequencies in the infrared because it doesn't perturb the electric field when it vibrates. CO2 can do uh, some specific frequencies. Uh, the frequencies that match the bending frequency and the asymmetrical stretch frequency. But gases in general are very, very picky about what flavors of infrared light they absorb and emit. Gases in general are not very good black bodies, whereas uh, condensed matter like the cloud or ice droplets, the, the, the water droplets or ice droplets in a cloud, uh, it's in this sort of a you know, claustrophobic mosh pit, this water molecule, a bunch of other water molecules all around. Uh, you can always find some water molecule that's just bounced against something else that can absorb or emit infrared in just about any frequency you want. So the ground of the Earth is a pretty good black body. When we did the layer model, we just set epsilon equal to 1. That's just saying, let's just call it a black body. That's close enough. Uh, most solids and liquids, like clouds, uh, water droplets, uh, trees, ice, stuff like that are pretty good black bodies. You didn't, I don't think I explicitly told you that, so for those who got it right, good guessing. <coughs> Maybe I did, I don't remember. Uh, and then, which is, uh, interacts with infrared but is a lousy black body? Pretty much already gave away the answer here. There we go. So, and I guess that's, that's it for iClickers today. Okay, thank you very much. I will see you on uh, Wednesday.